Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me for a daily spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Butchester. You know what I like to do on my show. I want to enlighten you. I want to inspire you. I want to empower you to become your best self. The scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today we are talking about character. The book God in Schools. Its author, Dr. Christine Van Horn. So you know what I'm going to tell you to do next. Go on, get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee or get your tea because we are about to get started. Good morning, Dr. Christine. Thank you so much for joining me on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. Well, thank you so very much. I am very happy to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, be talking with you today. I'm glad you could make it today. Now, as is the custom around here, we always give our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves to the few people out there that may be unfamiliar with you or with your work. So my first question to you, Dr. Christine, is what makes you, you? I I think I'm... For me, it's, it's writing. The Lord, I really have a heart for scriptures to look for the, the deeper things that God meant in his word. And he's led me down a pathway of, um, you know, really inspiring me, I think, for looking at our country and seeing how we could do things um, as better people of character and for the youth of our, our country. So I I have a doctorate degree in theology with an emphasis in biblical studies and uh, through the International College of Excellence under the direction of Dr. Rob Thompson, who is my senior pastor at Family Harvest Church in Tinley Park, Illinois. And I have worked in the children's ministry there for many years and was a team leader for um, what we call Character Club. So I've been focusing on character for our youth uh, for a long period of time. I also have some other books um, called The Lamb Eternal, The Tower of the Flock, and a book for our youth and family reading called Captain Character. Uh, so it's a chapter book series for our youth and family reading. Absolutely. Now, being an author, is that something that you've always wanted to do, or did you find that that was just the next thing uh, along life's path? Uh, well, I was one of the unusual people who, in high school, loved to write an essay, loved to write a term paper. I, I have loved writing, but I have found that that's how the Lord speaks to me. He will give me a phrase. He will give me um, some words, and I just go to a computer, write it down, and it evolves into the book. So when I wrote God in School, I did not set out trying to write a book about God in School. I had a few words that the Lord gave me, and I didn't know what it meant, but I sat at my computer and wrote, and it evolved into what became God in School. Uh Now, the title of the book, God in School, how did you determine that you wanted to use those three words to be the title to your work? I I just feel also that that was something that the Lord led me to in the process of writing, um, it, I started writing essentially a chapter in the book. I had no idea that it was going to be God in school, but I think that's how God is with us. You know, he gives us a little bit and he lies, you know, leads us step by step. And, and that's how it, it was. So at a certain point in time, I just knew that that's what he wanted it to become. So I, I don't think I really set out to choose to do that, um, but it was something he guided me to at, as a name. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I can definitely relate to that. Now, the the ideal reader of your book, did you write this for students to be able to read themselves? Did you write it to be used more like a, a part of um, school or Sunday school curriculum? Who's the ideal reader here? This is actually a book for adults. So it's geared more for parents, teachers, principals. It's, it's an adult book and teaching them what they can do um, to to help make our children better people of character. So it focuses at an adult level on, uh, you know, how the American school system was originally founded. And it was founded on biblical principles. It was founded on the idea of 
uh, children being educated so they could read the Bible, and we've seen how that has really changed. And um, But I had written the book Captain Character, which is really um, the, the youth version or the family reading version of, of getting that information on character. But uh, that in school is really meant for adults. Mm-hmm. Now, do you suggest that when reading the book that they read it from cover to cover uh, like a, a, a traditional novel? Uh, should they do it chapter by chapter, perhaps more like a devotional? How should they actually read the book? It, I think they should read it chapter by chapter. Each chapter is different. It builds upon the other. So, you know, it starts off with the foundation of our country and how – how um God was in schools. Our, our American school system was founded on biblical principles, and it was meant so that students would learn the Bible in school. And so it sets the stage for that, and it takes us on a pathway of how things changed with prayer being taken out of school, with different policies in our country being in place. And then it leads us on a pathway to look at what can we do as solutions to ensure that God is put back into the school system, and it really can be done. Mm -hmm. Now, where would you say that the nation is today? How should we um, understand how your book is relevant to today's time? How do we talk about character in today's society? Good good point. Our our nation is really in a crisis when it comes to character. If you look around you and just look at all what we see in the news, all the, the, you know, fighting against the the police, all the riots, all the the unrest that we see, that really displays a lack of good character. And it's indicative, I think, of what started happening in our country a long time ago, and we've evolved to this point in time. So it's important that we as adults, we as Christians, really rise up and 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 take a stand to better teach our youth what it means, um, what what it means to be people of character. Mm-hmm. Now, based upon your book, um, can you explain a little bit more about how you talk about American public schools? And you kind of touched on it a, a little bit before saying that it was founded on biblical principles. There are, you know, a generation out there that does not necessarily remember when prayer was in school. They are only used to a system where we don't say the Pledge of Allegiance, nor do we pray in school. So how do you touch on that in the book? Well, when our our school system was founded, it was founded specifically using the Bible so that children would learn how to to read the Bible. They, the early founders of the American school system did not want our children to be illiterate. You know, they knew what had happened in the Dark Ages period of time when, when people didn't know the Bible because they couldn't read. And so the point was really to teach them reading and to teach them all of this so they could pick up and, and use the Bible. And that went on for a very long period of time. And then in the, in the 1960s and 1970s, um, I, I believe with all the, the, the rights, the rebellion, all that, that stuff that started to evolve, it really opened the door for Satan to come in and start removing, you know, morals, uh, from our country, from the integrity, uh, of our country. And then several things really started to happen. Uh, in our school system and our, our whole nation, we were found, founded upon Judeo-Christian ideals, and we really were, and that was the intent. And I just want to give you an example of something that that is representative of the early founding of our country. These were two laws that were put into place. This first one was from 1642, and it's called the Old Deluder Satan Act. And listen to this. It says, uh, it being one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of scriptures as in the former time, and they were referring to the Dark Ages. And this was applied to school laws. And here's another one, the Northwest Ordinance. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. So religion, morality, and knowledge were all tied together. And when we took 
religion out of our school system. Morality started floundering. Education has floundered. And then it opened the door to uh, people wanting to, you know, take take a stand against um, prayer in school and prayer in the public domain. And it and it just uh, it just changed everything from the original meaning as it was really intended in our country. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I I love that you have brought a, a bit of uh, history uh, into that. And thank you so much for for mentioning of uh, the Northwest Ordinance. That ordinance that is so important, especially for people understanding what uh, what it guaranteed as much as what it abolished. So if you are unfamiliar with that, listener, there's a bit of history homework for you. Check that out, and I think that you will find it to be uh, quite interesting. Now we have about two minutes left in in this particular segment, but I wanted to ask you about the elimination of prayer in in schools. Now, I was a young person who, who, God bless my parents, uh, allowed me to go to uh, Christian school. So I have been able to pray in school. I've been able to worship in school and all of that and speak very openly about my faith. However, public school, you can't do that. Now, if you even wear a T-shirt or a backpack that has anything um, mentioning uh, your religion, it could cost you, uh, it could get you in trouble. It could get you, you know, cause you a little bit of trouble there. Um, What do you think has become the result of the elimination of prayer? Do you think that it has had a mental effect, a a spiritual effect, an overall um, attitude um, adjustment that needs to be done in our schools with our kids? It, it's totally um, changed what school used to be. So children in school, um, you know, not only do they not pray, they can't have, we can't have the Ten Commandments in school. And, and it's, it's taken a detrimental effect. Uh, what started all of it was people feeling that um, prayer came against what's called the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. They did not mean to take religion out of schools. And it meant the opposite, that our country couldn't form a church like the Church of England uh, had formed, uh, or England had formed the Church of England. But in the process of eliminating prayer, you know, then it was removal of the Ten Commandments, all of those foundational things that are critical to the development of our youth are absent. And the effect is terrible. They, you know, they don't know. You shall not steal. They don't realize all these things that, that they shouldn't be doing because all of that has been removed. And when that initially occurred, the country was really outraged that this was going on. This was not what the country wanted as a whole, but it was forced upon them. And, and it's something that we're living with to this very day, in detrimental effects. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Christine, it is time for us to go to break. But before we do, can you remind everyone, please, what is the title of your book? Where can we get a copy? And how do we stay in contact with you? Absolutely. The title of my book is called God in School, and it is available through my website, which is www drchris.co, not com, dot co. So it's www.drchris.co. Uh, it is available through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Westbow Press, which is the publisher. So you can uh, reach out to me that way as well. All righty, everyone. Now you know where you can get a copy. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Butchester. My guest today is Dr. Christine Van Horn, and we're talking about her book, God in Schools. Now, Dr. Christine, we were kind of touching on this a little bit earlier, and I think people are familiar with the phrase, and that is separation of church and state. How do you address this in your book? It is a very important topic. Um, People today, if you ask them about the word separation of church and state, they will tell you it's in the Constitution, and it is not. Um, You know, what we call separation of church and state really was meant um, 
in the way it was initially founded to, to mean the opposite. And, you know, people have said, this is in the Constitution. It is not. It was actually, those terms were written in a letter um, between President uh, Jefferson and the Danbury uh, Baptist Association in Danbury, Connecticut. And it was in a personal letter, and it meant the opposite of what we have said. He was talking about the importance of not building a wall of separation between church and state. And that was his heart, that we all can do this and work together. And it was taken out of context, and it is, you know, told by everybody, it's in the Constitution, and that's why we need to take, you know, God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools, the public domain, the workplace, and it and it never was. So what what has been really difficult in our country is we've taken words from a personal letter and written it into law as if it were in the Constitution, and it never was. Um, you know, after this had occurred, it was early on decided that, you know, this was going to be, you know, our, our law, but not everybody really understood that that was what it meant. And so, um, you know, one of the justices in the Supreme Court, he saw through this, and he said, you know, this is a metaphor based on bad history, and it needs to be abandoned, but it isn't. It, it now everybody thinks this is part of the Constitution, and it never ever was. You are so correct, and thank you so much for uh, mentioning that. And and you are you are so right. I think it really does um, help where where you live um, because you go a little bit more in depth. And you're right; it was a personal letter. Um, if if I'm remembering correctly, I believe it was. Um, um, a pastor who was who was trying to express himself only because as I'm from the original uh, state of Virginia. Uh, it's something that we discuss in, in trying to um, express themselves better about religious tolerance and freedom. So yes, you you are you are so correct about that and how things have. Um, evolved and and how things are now so uh, folded over that we forget many times the original conversations that are had to to make things to make things happen you're so right that became an amendment it was not in the original thank you so much for mentioning that now what does the what does the word of god say about how we are supposed to conduct ourselves when we're in school. We we have so many instructions about our do's, our don'ts. Um, our listeners are familiar with, you know, what it, how you're supposed to behave as a woman, but how are you supposed to behave as a student? Well, uh, you need to follow the Word of God. The unfortunate thing is there's so many of the youth that um, – don't know the Word of God. So it's important for teachers and principals, they can teach this without saying what it is. Um, you know, when we look at the problems that are going on in school, there's a lot of rebellion. And I think the thing that we need to teach our youth is that they need to respect the authorities in their lives, the society and the world, the world around them, and their teachers and principals at school. Uh, the Word of God talks about submission to authority. That's, a, that's one of God's laws. It has to occur in school, but it's not occurring to the level that it should. What teachers and, and principals can teach is, you know, talking about chain of command. You know, that's a, a secular way of saying, you know, authority. And so we need to talk about, you know, following rules. And if the teacher says something, you need to follow it. And, and these are the ways that we can teach God's principles in the school environment without calling it out because there are laws in place that say you cannot do these things, but there are ways around it. You know, as you, as you think back to, to school, um, you know, now, nowadays we're, we're, we're worrying about people coming to school with, with guns and shooting our kids and the kids are worried to be there. But if you look back into the 1950s when we had prayer in school and when kids could read the Bible and we understood following the authorities in our lives, the biggest problem in school were Spit balls and chewing gum in the classroom. And, and look where we have come, you know, from, from those ways that seem so innocent now, but those were the big problems back then to, you know, worrying about somebody coming to school with, with guns and, and shooting them up. Um, the Ten Commandments 
apply in school. There are ways that you can teach the Ten Commandments without calling them the Ten Commandments. They do apply. And we need to be really careful uh, about what children, you know, bring into the classroom. You know, you had mentioned, you know, like clothes and, and things like that. There are laws in place at the schools that need to be followed, you know, different types of dress codes that are really, really important because they're worried about gang signs or gang symbols and stuff coming into the school. But, um, it, you know, there are ways that we can use that to show also, you know, dressing modestly and, and, and things like that. Um, for the teacher or the principal in the school, you've got responsibility. Uh, you are in authority whether, you know, students try to follow that or not. Um, it, but you need to use that authority, that God-given authority, to do the role that you are called to do. Mm-hmm. Now, how should um, and, and I'm not sure if you if you touched on this in or on your book or not, um, but if, if you didn't, just just your thoughts is is fine. Um, unfortunately, so many times we hear about that occasional teacher that uh, is is caught by a student phone that is being disrespectful to a student. We 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 talk about the student respecting the authority of of the teacher. Um, do you talk about how teachers, administrators, and adults should also be respectful of, of the needs of students and making sure that though they are the adults, that there's a, a mutual sense of respect there? There really needs to be um, because students – you don't know what environment those students are coming into the classroom with. You don't know what's going on in their homes. And you bring up such a good point that, that teachers, uh, principals, they need to be very aware um, of that respect for the student because they could have lived a, a terrible environment in their home life and they're coming into school for a safe environment. And, and we need to ensure that they have that there. So there are responsibilities that teachers and principals and, and all school workers have towards those students. They are, they are people that need dignity and respect and we, we need to ensure it doesn't matter what, what age, what color or boy or girl or whatever, they need to be treated with the dignity that, that God would want them to have. So what you mentioned is very important. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that you are you are so right. Depending on where you live in in the world, you know, unfortunately, there are some schools that really are trying to educate our students that are certainly in that that disadvantaged group, and they are dealing with things that we just don't think about on a day to day basis. So I, I like how how you address that that there does there does need to be that understanding and and look at who, who is my student base here, and do perhaps I need to have a little bit more caring in this situation, um, just to to make sure that that uh, that openness and that respect is there. I, I love that answer. Now, speaking of the various dynamics, we we talked about students, we talked about teachers and administrators and faculty. What about the parents? What can we do? for our children when we are the parent to make sure that everyone is as balanced and has this um, uh, this mutual communica- communication um, with all. That is really important. Um, the first thing you need to do is know what's going on in your child's school and make sure that you send your child into that environment with respect and dignity and following good character. Parents need to teach their children character. Kids are going to mimic what they see. So parents need to be people of character. And then their children will follow suit and they will, well, they will do the same thing. So, you know, having a good home base where you're teaching character, teaching them how to go into the school environment, respecting for the teachers, the fellow students, um, is extremely important. And a way that parents can get into the school, it's, it's a little harder these days. Kids are, you know, not in school like they are. But when we go back to the, the regular way of, of being in school, um, I highly recommend that parents become a volunteer. 
whether it's even just being in the, you know, at, at lunchtime or in the classroom or out on the playground, the influence that you can have over the lives of the kids. If you see something that's not going a certain way, you can really go up to those children and just kind of talk about being kind and, and using character words as a way to show godly principles without, you know, being overtly saying anything about scripture. Uh, so, so th- there are some gentle, easy ways that parents can can do those kind of things. Um, they can also really understand the foundation of our country and the foundation of the American school system. So there's there's some references that that I have in my book. Um, one of them is Wall Builders with David Barton, and he talks about the the early Christian. Um, education and the early Christian system, what you can do is become educated. So, you know, I think that's important. We don't have to accept what we see in schools now is the only way it can be, uh, but really understand what it was meant to be and, and work to, to make some changes. Parents do not have to just be accepting of the terrible curriculums in school where things that are not the way God would want uh, to be what is taught to their children there are ways that they can have influences and they need to do that and, and get involved in really understanding what the curriculum is. Their, their children do not have to innocently be taught the, you know, these terrible things as really being good. So it, it's important they get involved. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I love that. Now, one of the things that you touched on earlier and I, and I really appreciate that answer is that teachers uh, need to remember who who their student base is, and that that student may be dealing with some stuff at home. When it comes to character, how can uh, teachers or principals or any administrator for for that that be be that bridge when it comes to those tough topics? Unfortunately, we know that um, there are some parents who have have some mindsets that. Um, aren't necessarily the best, be it that, that we're talking about uh, gender, uh, race, ethnicity. Um, how do we talk about those things and still keep in mind that God said, love one another? How, are, how can we be people of character, love one another, but still talk about some of those tough topics? It's, it's a delicate balance mostly teachers need to do in the classroom. Um, Some of the students are going to come in prepared because their parents will be showing them how to be people of character, Um, but many will not. And so teachers need to, I think teachers need to really study what character is and uh, get a better Mm -hmm. understanding for what they can do. They're, They're simple words. You can talk about being kind to one another and you're really showing the love of God, but you can do it by other terms, and if they can kind of show them and diffuse situations if two kids are fighting, rather than just reprimanding them and and focusing on the negative, they can focus on the positive. What would have happened, you know, they could say to a student, if you walked up to this other one and, and you said something kind or sweet instead, it diffuses the situation. So if, if somebody's trying to pick a fight with you, you know, you could do something simple. You know, I really like that jacket you're wearing. What What is that person who wants to pick a fight going to do? It diffuses it. But this is all biblical. But there, but there's ways that we can just really act those those things out and, and make them occur. And, and just being able to show and teach the kids, like you said, to love one another, no matter what color they are, what race they are, what what gender they are. I mean, we need to love one another, and and that's missing so much out in the in the world in general. But you have a small environment in a classroom where you can really show it and have an impact on the lives of of our young. Oh, I love that answer because unfortunately we do hear about um, our students saying uh, bullying is such a huge problem that it is not the bullying that uh, we experienced uh, when when I was in school, but it is just on such a grand level. They have just taken it and, and, and made it something just so tough 
for for some of our students, we we hear about um, some of our our young people just not wanting to even go to school or not even participate anymore because some students are just bullying them. So I, I think that is a that is a great thing. What a what a great bit of information um to to remind our teachers of diffuse instead of reprimanding first sometimes to really um see what's going what's going on. I love that answer. Well Dr. Christine, it is time for us to take our last break um for today. But before we go, um can you remind everyone what is the title of your book? Where can we get a copy and how do we stay in contact with you? Absolutely. So my book is called God in School and my website is www.drchris that's Dr. Chris, dot co, not com, but dot co. So, uh, www.drchris.co. And the information on my books and contacting me and everything is through that website. I uh, love it. Alrighty, listeners, now you know where you can get a copy. We are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. My guest today is Dr. Christine Van Horn, and we're talking about her book, God in School. Now, Dr. Christine, um, I want to ask you about um, how how students, how children can can have a better understanding when it comes to good character. We know that um, it used to be, you know, repetition uh, is a great way to remember certain things. When we're trying to remember or understand what good character is and how we display that, and what can we do to help our children remember good character? Well, number one, if children are going to watch what the adults do. So it is very important if you are teacher or parent or around children that you hold yourself to that standard first. If they see it in you, they're going to mimic what you do. And then it, it can be automatically there. Uh, we need to teach them uh, about character. Uh, you know, just like I, I keep going back to being kind. Um, you know, you talked about, you know, bullying. What I have done in, in my book series uh, for kids, Captain Character, is I've addressed some of those topics. So bullying is actually one of the things I addressed in there and taught them what to do to diffuse a situation like this. And so, um, you know, we, we can give them good reading. Uh, for things like that, there are other resources like that out there for kids. A lot of the schools do have character programs, so it's important for the parents to know what is being taught in those programs and then be able to tell them um, how they would want them to, to live out those um, character traits. So in Captain Character, the book series I have on my Captain Character website, and there's a link to it through the Dr. Chris. Um, I, I have a parent reading plan, so it can take those topics and the character traits and give sample questions. Parents can take those same type of questions and apply it to whatever character traits the kids might be studying in school as well. It, it's like how to set up a dialogue with your student about some of these tough situations and about how to be a person of character uh, in those uh, different situations. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I do want to ask you a few questions about uh, your process for being an author. We have so many folks that um, love the fact that I ask these questions because it inspires them. It gives them a bit of direction uh, when they happen to get with that being said, when you were writing um, any of your books, for, for that matter, did you find that you needed a particular environment? Did you need it to be quiet? Uh, did you prefer evening over morning? Did you have a particular way um, in which you need it to be in order to uh, write successfully for the day? I wish you could see me because you're making me smile. Um, it was interesting because I followed the Lord's leading. And sometimes, uh, you know, like early in the morning on a Saturday morning, I would hear, arise and write. And it's like, okay, I guess I'm going to go sit at my computer okay. and 
house. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go shopping. I'm not going to clean my house. I'm going to go sit and write now. And when I followed the leadings of the Holy Spirit kind of guiding me is when the information flowed. So um, I, I really relied on God. Sometimes it was late at night. Sometimes it was early in the morning. Sometimes it was not even. It, it really varied. Um, or when I felt like the, the Lord dropped a couple of words into my spirit, I'd go immediately and sit at the computer and write it. And I would keep a notebook uh, handy. So if something, you know, came, came into to my thought process or into my spirit during the day, I could go write things down. And then I could go back to it later. And I would find when I had a window of time, the Lord used it. So if I knew I had an evening that was free, I'd get my notepad and I'd just sit at the computer and write these words or phrases or ideas down. And then I'd just start writing. And so he, he responded to, to my time as well when, when I had that ability to write. And, and he, he just guided me. And, and it was um, not something that I let. I really believe it was led by the Lord. I love that answer. Now, I know as a pastoral counselor, one of the things that I suggest for uh, my client base or anyone who takes a workshop is is that you need to journal. Get the thought out of your yep. head. Get it on paper and just allow that that to happen because it is important. But I kind of uh, chuckled a little bit on my end because I said, oh, she mentioned the handy-dandy notebook. It is more than <laughs> just something suggested on Blue Foods. It is so incredibly important. We should have it. Even even if you want to jot it down on your phone, that's one thing. But for me, I'm a little bit more of a traditionalist. I love writing it. Uh, it makes more of a connection for me, and I'm able to retain what I wrote. And it's Thanks, God. That was awesome. I can't wait till I get home to really be able to put more down. But you're right. Writing it down makes all the difference in the world. Now, when when you held um, God in schools, when you when you held your finished work in your hands, and I know that you have other books, but when you when you held that up and you said, "This is it. It's complete, and it's just ready to be sold to the world." How did you feel in that moment? I I really just, you know, went to prayer to the Lord and was like, Lord, this is your book. Your work is complete. Guide me on what I need to do. And um, it, it just, it, when I wrote this originally, uh, it ended up to become my doctoral dissertation. Uh, it did not intend to, to be that way as I was writing it. Um, but my advisor said, you need to write this into a book. So I needed to rewrite it into a book style. And, and I did. So I saw that finished product actually twice, once as my dissertation and then once as this book. And and when I wrote it, um, it, 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 it didn't feel complete. What I mean is it was done, but I had work to do. I, I, I knew it was the beginning of something more. I needed to talk mm-hmm. about this. I needed to relay this message. So the book was complete, but my work was beginning. And, and so, you know, and that, and that's maybe a different perspective when people write books, maybe they think it's done. But for me, it was like, okay, now I've got, now I have a mission. This is my mission. And Lord, I need you to, to guide me moving forward. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you said that because there's someone out there saying, yes, it's like, okay, phase one is complete on to phase (laughs) two, you know, on to the, to the next. Part of it, and you are so right because there is that person who needs to be able to have that alone time to digest your book, but then they need to have that more um, personal time, that one-on-one or that more intimate time with you, like the setting that we have now, where they can actually hear from you and they can get that clarification um, that perhaps they they said, well, "Does she mean that?" Listen to a program and go, aha, there it is, and get that epiphany that they were looking for. I love it. I think that God definitely uses us in different ways and in different places to really uh, help us get the clarity that we need when we're ready for it. So I, I agree with you. I love the fact that you are open to God doing more than just using you to write the book, but to really share this with the masses. Well, Dr. Christine Van Horn, thank you so much for spending time with me here today. I have enjoyed
enjoyed my conversation with you, and I'm pretty sure that our listeners have as well. Before I let you go, can you remind everyone one last time, the title of your book, where can we get a copy, and how do we stay in contact with you? Okay, very good. So my book is called God in School, and it can be um, purchased through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Westbow Press. But all of those links for doing it are on my website, which is www.drchris, as in one word, Dr. Chris, dot co. So, um, and then there's links for getting the book and for being in contact with me. And I have enjoyed this very much today, Dr. Angela. I appreciate this a lot. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you again for being a guest. And listeners, thank you as well for tuning in. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to spend your time with us here today. And I thank you. I hope that we have enlightened, inspired, and empowered you to be your best. As always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember, you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.